Sunday, within the octave of the Ascension, the Gospel of the Sunday according to John. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, When the paraclete cometh, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceedeth from the Father, he shall give testimony of me. And you shall give testimony, because you are with me from the beginning. These things have I spoken to you, that you may not be scandalized. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the hour cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth a service to God. And these things will they do to you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the hour shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. The Words of the Gospel Exposition from the Catena Aurea But when the paraclete cometh, whom I will send you, the disciples might well say to the Lord, If they have heard from thee words no other man hath spoken, if they have seen works which no one else has done, and yet have gained nothing from them, if they have not known the Father and thee together with him, why do you send us forth? How are we to be believed? So that they might not be troubled thinking such thoughts, he consoles them, saying, When the paraclete shall come, he shall give testimony of me. As though he said, When they saw me, they hated me, and put me to death. But the paraclete shall give such testimony regarding me, that he will make those believe in me who do not see me. And because he shall give testimony of me, you also shall give testimony. Hence, and you shall give testimony, he by inspiring your hearts, you proclaiming him with your voices. And so you shall be enabled to proclaim what you know, because you are with me from the beginning, which now you do not, because you have not within you the fullness of the Spirit. For the charity of God, which shall be poured forth in your hearts by the Holy Spirit, which shall be given to you, will give you the courage to give testimony, he, giving testimony and forming steadfast witnesses, removes fear from the hearts of Christ's friends and changes to love the hatred of enemies. He calls the Holy Spirit who is to come the Comforter, giving him this name by reason of his work. For he will not alone comfort those he finds worthy and deliver them from all sorrow and confusion of soul, but he will in very truth bestow upon them a certain incredible joy Everlasting joy takes up its abode in the hearts where the Holy Spirit shall dwell. This consoling spirit is sent to us from the Son, not by means of the ministry of angels, or of prophets or apostles, but as he must be sent by the wisdom and power of God, having with that same wisdom and power identity of nature. For as the Son that is sent is not cut off from the Father, nor separated from him, but abides with him, possessing him within himself, so the Holy Spirit, sent by the Son in the manner we have said, does not proceed from the Father as though passing from one place to another. For as the Father is not rooted in one place, since he is above all created things, so neither is the Spirit of truth enclosed within the bounds of place, since he also is incorporeal and far excelling even all rational creatures. He calls him not the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of Truth, that he may show us that he is worthy of our faith. And he says that he proceedeth from the Father, that is, that he knew all things, as Christ says also of himself, I know whence I came, and whither I go. But though he could have said from God, or from the Omnipotent, he does not, but says from the Father, not that the Father is other than the same omnip omnipotent God, but that the Spirit of truth is said to proceed from him as from the distinct being and mind of the Father. For when the Son sends the Spirit of truth, whom he has called the Comforter, so also does the Father, since it is by the same will of both the Father and Son that the Spirit comes. Elsewhere he says that the Father sends the Holy Spirit, now he says that he will send them and by this indicates his equality with the Father. Lest, however, he should appear as opposed to the Father, as though he should send the Spirit from another and a rival authority, he says, Whom I will send from the Father, 
the Father, as it were, consenting and sending with him. But when you hear that he proceedeth from the Father, do not by this understand a mission concluded from without them, as in the case of ministering spirits, but that he speaks here of a certain singular and distinct mission that is attributed to the Spirit alone. For procession is the natural mode of being of the Spirit. We must not therefore take proceed as meaning to send, but as expressing his natural mode of being from the Father. Here perhaps someone might ask whether the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Son, for the Son is the Son of the Father alone, and the Father is Father only of the Son, but the Holy Ghost is not the Spirit of one of them, but of both. On one occasion our Lord himself says, For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you. And again you read in the Apostle, God hath sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. Nor do I think he is called the Spirit for any other cause. For if we should be questioned regarding each single person, we cannot but say that the Father as well as the Son is a Spirit. It was fitting that that which they both singly and together are called, he also should be called, who is not one or other of them, but in whom what they possess is common, is manifested. Why then may we not hold that the Holy Ghost also proceeds from the Son, since he is also the Spirit of the Son? For if he did not proceed from him, he would not after his resurrection have breathed upon his disciples, saying, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. It is of this power also we must believe the evangelist was speaking when he says, For virtue went out from him and healed all. If then the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, why does the Son say, Who proceedeth from the Father? Unless that it is just that he is wont to refer what is his to him, from whom he also has being. For this he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If then it is his doctrine, which he yet says is not his but the Father's, how much more should we here understand that the Holy Ghost proceeds from him also, though he says, Who proceedeth from the Father? Yet not as though he were also saying, From me he does not proceed. From whom then the Son derives that he is God, from the same the Holy Spirit derives that he proceeds from him. Hence it may in some way be understood why the Holy Ghost is not said to be born, but rather to proceed, since if he also were to be called Son, he should then be called Son of both, which would be absurd, since no son is the offspring of two, except of a father and a mother. Far be it from us to consider any such thing between God the Father and God the Son. For neither does a son of men proceed at the same time from both father and mother, for when he proceeds from the father to the mother, he is not then proceeding from the mother, and when he comes to this light from the mother, he is not then proceeding from the father. But, but the Holy Ghost does not proceed from the father to the son, and from the son proceed to the sanctifying of the creature, but proceeds at the same time from both. Neither can we say that the Holy Spirit is not life, when the father is life and the son is life, and therefore as the Father has life within himself, and also gave it to the Son to have life within himself, so has he given the Spirit life to proceed from him as it proceeds from himself. These things have I spoken to you that you may not. Rightly then, after promising them the Holy Spirit, by whose power working within them they would become witnesses unto him, he goes on, these things I have said, that you may not be scandalized. For when the charity of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who is given to us, great peace comes to those who love God, so that there is no scandal for them. Then giving expression in words to that which they were to suffer, he says, they will put you out of the synagogues. For they, the Jews, had already agreed among themselves, that if any man should confess him to be the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. But what harm was it that the apostles should be put out of the synagogues of the Jews? For were they not about to cut themselves off from them, 
even if no one should put them out of them? But by this he wished to warn them that the Jews would not receive Christ, whom they themselves would not abandon. For as there was no other people of God than this seed of Abraham, if they should acknowledge Christ, we should not have here the churches of Christ, there the synagogues of the Jews. But since they would not, what is left but that continuing apart from Christ, they should put out of the synagogues those who would not abandon Christ. And then, after he had said this to them, he added, Yea, the hour cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doth a service to God. These words he added as though to console those who would be driven out from the synagogues. Would it be that this sundering from the synagogues would so trouble them that they would prefer to die rather than linger on in this life outside the congregation of the Jews? Be it far from us to think they should be so troubled who sought not the glory of men but the glory of God. This then is the meaning of the words. They will put you out of the synagogues. Have no fear of this isolation. Though cut off from their congregations, you shall bring together so many in my name that they, in fear lest the temple and the mysteries of the old law be forsaken, shall kill you, and think that in doing so they render a service to God, having a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. We must take these words to be said of the Jews, of whom he had said, They will put you out of the synagogues, for the witnesses of Christ, that is, the martyrs, even if they were killed by the Gentiles, these did not think that they did a service to God, but to their own false deities. But every Jew who killed Christ's preachers thought he did a service to God, in the belief that whoever became converted to Christ would betray Israel. And so enraged at this, and having a zeal for God, though not according to wisdom, Thinking to do a service to God, they put them to death. Then he added for their consolation, And these things will they do to you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. As if to say, For your consolation it is enough that you suffer these things for my Father and me. Lest, however, these evils, which were however speedily to pass away, should come of a sudden upon souls which were unaware and unprepared, he, for this reason, foretells them when he goes on to say, But these things I have told you, that when the hour cometh. Their hour was a dark hour, an hour of night, but the night of the Jews has commingled none of its confusion with the Christian day that is now separated from it. He foretold this for yet another reason, that they might not say he did not foresee the future, and this he intimates when he says, that you may remember what I have told you. And that they might not say, Soothing us, he told us only the things that would please us. He indicates to them that it was for this reason he had not told them this from the beginning, saying, But I told you not these things from the beginning, because I was with you, because you were in my care, and it was lawful for you to question me when you wished. It was against me the whole assault was directed. Hence it was not necessary to tell you these things from the beginning. It was for this I did not speak, not because I did not then know of them. But the other three evangelists show that he foretold these things before the time of the supper, whereas, according to John, it was when this was over that he spoke of them. Perhaps the question is answered in this way, that they also relate that he was close to his passion when he spoke of these things, not, therefore, from the beginning, when he was with them. But Matthew records that these things were foretold, not alone on the eve of the Passion, but from the beginning. What then does he mean when he says, I told you not these things from the beginning, if not the things which he here tells them concerning the Holy Ghost, that he is to come upon them and give testimony, when they shall suffer these evils? These are the things he did not tell them from the beginning, when he was with them, and they possessed the comfort of his presence. But now that he was about to leave them, it was necessary that he should tell them that he was to come by whose means it would be that charity would be poured out into their hearts, and they would, with confidence, preach the word of God. He had forewarned them 
that they would suffer torments, but not that their slaying would be, be regarded as a service to God, which would have greatly terrified them, or because he had spoken of the things they must suffer from the Gentiles, but here he tells them of what they must suffer at the hands of the Jews. St. Gaudentius, Bishop of Brescia, on the promised coming of the Paraclete. In his ineffable wisdom, the Son of God deigned to communicate step by step to his disciples an understanding of the truths of his saving faith, for their human hearts could not grasp it all at once. And in the discourses he had already spoken to them, he had, as I showed you in my last sermon, made known to them many things concerning the oneness of his own divinity with that of the Father, making clear that there was no separation between them, so that even the words he spoke to them were not, he declared, his but the Father's, and the word which you have heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In this sentence he makes it abundantly clear that all who reject the teaching of his only begotten Son reject the teaching of the Father also, since the Son says that the words he spoke are not his, but the Father's, and from this it follows that if they are the words of the Father, they are also the words of the Son. For he declares, All things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. And in another place he says to the Father, And all things are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And this manifestly because of the oneness of the divine substance, which recognizes nothing as part of it which does not belong to the divine nature. Now, however, following on this, he immediately lays down that we must believe that the Holy Ghost also shares in this same oneness, when he foretells that the fullness of his teaching shall be perfected in them by the same paraclete, declaring, These things have I spoken to you, abiding with you. But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your mind, whatsoever I shall have said to you. He deigned by these words to the blessed apostles to forewarn them both of his own ascent into heaven after the passion he was to suffer, and of the descent upon them from heaven of the Holy Spirit, when he said, These things have I spoken to you, abiding with you. But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send, but the Holy Spirit was not in heaven only, and not upon earth, and neither would the Son so ascend into heaven as to forsake the earth. Neither did the Father alone possess the throne of heaven, whither the Son is said to return, and whence the Holy Ghost is said to come. For the most blessed prophet makes this acknowledgment to the Father, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy face? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I descend into hell, thou art present. If I take my wings early in the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. If I take wings in the morning, he says, it is well that he has wings, and that taking them he may reach whither he wills. Yet, since he dwelt in a body, in what manner could the prophet ascend into heaven, or descend into hell, or reach to the farthest parts of the sea? What manner then of wings has he? The soul of the believer takes to itself wings of faith, so that raised above earthly things and dwelling wholly in the Spirit, it can comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the knowledge of God. But heretics, not possessing these wings of faith, dispute concerning God and have in mind only the things of earth, and weighed down by the burden of earthly considerations, they are led away from the loftiness of the knowledge of divine things towards that which is carnal and fleeting. Neither can they come to the understanding of that boundless divinity where only the believing soul has access, which perceives, believes, confesses, and proclaims the unity of the adorable Trinity. And since it cannot fittingly express this in words, in this also, is it worthy of praise? Whither then shall I go, he says, from thy spirit? Or where shall I flee from thy face? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. 
If I descend into hell, thou art present. If I take my wings early in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there also thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. This confession likewise proclaims the undivided nature of the Trinity. Whither shall I go, he says, from thy spirit? From thy paraclete, that is, whose ful fullness the apostles receiving made known through the mouth of Peter, the fulfillment of the divine promise, proclaiming, This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and in the last days I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And whither shall I flee from thy face? From the Son, therefore, who is the face of the Father, since the Father is seen in the Son, according to the words of our Lord and Saviour himself, who when Philip besought him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us, so answered, Have I been so long a time with you, and have you not known me? Philip, he that seeth me seeth the Father also. How sayest thou? Show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Neither must the Holy Spirit be regarded as separated from the Father, whose Spirit he is, nor the Son be believed to be separated from him whose face he is, and right hand, and power, and wisdom. He does not say, If I ascend into heaven, thy Spirit is there, or thy face, and thy Spirit are there. But thou, he says, art present, and with thy Son, and with the Holy Ghost. For one and the same everywhere and forever is the divinity of the ever-adorable Trinity. But so that a clear faith and separate belief in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost might be given to those who believe, it is accordingly written that the Father sends both the Son and the Holy Ghost, since neither he who sends nor he who is sent can be believed to be God, if there is a place where he is, and a place where he is not. Let us believe in the Son, speaking to us, since he is the truth. I am not alone, he says, because the Father is with me. And again, speaking of the Holy Spirit, but, he says, if I by the Spirit of God cast out devils. And the evangelist Luke speaking, but Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan. Accordingly, since nowhere is the divinity of the Trinity not present, it is part of the divine plan for the redemption of mankind that it is spoken of as both sending and being sent. For otherwise the human mind could not grasp the Father is the Father, and the Son is the Son, and the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost, unless it should learn their separateness by the naming of one as sent and one as sending. And again, faith could not acknowledge the one divinity of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, unless it had read that he that was sent was in no way separate from him who sent him. For the Father, as has been said, did not forsake the Son whom he had sent, nor is the Holy Ghost, who was to guide the apostles, ever shown as not present with the Father and the Son, so that only the Son of God has become incarnate, for as we read, the Word was made flesh, not the Father or the Holy Ghost. Just as the Son of God has fulfilled the mystery of the Incarnation without detracting from the oneness of the Trinity, this wondrous omnipotence is witness how the same Son of God has so ascended into heaven with the body he assumed from among men that he would remain with his disciples till the end of the world. For, says he, Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world, not alone with his apostles, but also with his disciples and all whosoever should believe in him. We must therefore believe that God exists in no other way than he by his own words proposes himself to our belief. Now should we regard his works with a disobedient spirit, but honor them with earnest faith, for the works of the Lord is right, and all his works are done with faithfulness. If all his works are done with faithfulness, how much more of the wondrous work of his most sacred incarnation! Let us then cease from submitting the divine mystery to insulting investigations, while faith is neglected. For the doubtings of the disbelieving, with their idle speculation, 
leads to no understanding of the works of God, but loses rather the faith that is known to be the guide to salvation and eternal life. That this excessive probing destroys faith can readily be understood from one kind of divine action. And God said, Be light made, and light was made. Since I do not come to know that the Creator made it out of nothing, unless I believe and confess that He made it, by impious deliberation I call God a liar. Therefore the mind of each single person who believes should accept with love and faith all the works of the Lord, and above all the supreme work of the incarnation of the Son of God, as the sacred scriptures teach us, and proclaim by the loyal obedience of the tongue what it believes with an unwavering heart. For with the heart we believe unto justice, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. By this that he promised, that the fullness of his teachings would be bestowed by the Holy Spirit, he desired that he should be believed equal with himself in omnipotence. For in the Trinity there is no master and there is no servant, God and an angel, the Creator and the creature, there is that in which they differ and that in which they are the same. In person they differ, in nature they are the same. And yet they are not gods, but God, for the oneness of God does not admit of any division. Lastly, Christ says of the Holy Spirit in this same place, whom the Father will send in my name, that is, in the name of God, to proclaim God, namely as the Son. And for this reason the Son also says of himself, I am come in the name of the Father. And this the prophet had already foretold of him, and the children praising him in the gospel confirmed it, when they cried out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And rightly does he come in the name of the Lord, not in the name of a servant, for he is God not in his own name, for he is the Son, and coming as Son, his name is that of the Father. The Son, accordingly, I repeat, proclaims of himself, I am come in the name of my Father. But of the Holy Ghost, he says, whom the Father will send in my name. And when he decreed that baptism should be conferred in the name of the Trinity, he did not say, in the names of, but in the name of. For the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, as I have often made clear to your charity from the testimonies of sacred scripture. And so one is the name of the Trinity, one is the power, and one the divinity, which shall endure forever and ever. Amen. St. Augustine, Bishop and Doctor, on the Paraclete. The Lord Jesus Christ, being now near his passion, and soon to leave them in his bodily presence, though in his spiritual presence he would be with them till the end of the world, encouraged them in the words he spoke to them after the supper, to bear steadfastly the persecutions of the ungodly, whom he calls the world. Yet it was from this world he had, he said, chosen the disciples, so that they might know that it was by the favor of God they were what they are, that they were what they were because of their own sins. Then he clearly states the Jews were both his persecutors and theirs, so that it should be very plain to them that these were also meant by the name world, which was condemned because it persecuted the saints. And when he said of them that they knew not him by whom he had been sent, and that they hated both father and son, that is, he that was sent, and he by whom he was sent, all of which things we have explained to you in the previous discourses, then he comes to this point, where he says that the word may be fulfilled which is written in their law, they hated me without cause. Then continuing, as in logical sequence he adds, that which we now undertake to explain to you. But when the paraclete cometh, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceedeth from the Father, he shall give testimony of me, and you will give testimony of me, because you are with me from the beginning. 
What has this to do with the previous sentence, which says, By now they have both seen and hated both me and my father, but that the word may be fulfilled which is written in their law? They hated me without cause. Is it that when the paraclete, the spirit of truth, comes, he will convince those who both see and hate by yet clearer proofs? And in fact, at his coming he did convert some of those who saw, and until then hated, to that faith which worketh by charity. Then, so that we may understand this, let us recall to mind what happened. For on the day of the Pentecost the Holy Spirit descended upon the hundred and twenty people who were gathered together, among whom were the apostles, who, being filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in the tongues of every nation, and many of those who hated, astonished at so great a miracle, were changed in heart and were converted, since when Peter spoke they saw, because of the great and divine testimony he put forward concerning Christ, that he was shown to be risen from the dead and to be living, who was believed by them to have been put to death and to be among the dead. And they received pardon because of the pre precious blood so blasphemously and so inhumanely spilled, and were redeemed by the blood they had shed. For the blood of Christ was shed for the remission of all sins, so it had the power to forgive also the sins by which it was shed. Having this in mind, he therefore said, They hated me without cause, but when the paraclete cometh, he shall give testimony of me. That is to say, they hated me, and seeing me they put me to death. But such will be the testimony the paraclete shall give of me, that it will make those who do not see me believe in me. And you, he says, shall give testimony, because you are with me from the beginning. The Holy Ghost will give testimony, and you also shall give testimony. For since you were with me from the beginning, you can preach that which you have seen, and that you do not now so now is because you have not yet the fullness of this Spirit. He shall give testimony of me, and you shall give testimony of me, and the charity of God that is poured forth into your hearts by the Spirit that will be given to you shall give you courage to give testimony. This had indeed been lacking in Peter till then, when terrified at the questioning of the servant maid, he had not had the power to give true testimony, but contrary to his promises was driven rather by grievous fear to deny him three times. Fear such as this has no place in charity, for true charity casts out fear. And thus it was that previous to the passion of the Lord, his servile fear was put to the test by the serving woman. After the Lord's resurrection, his generous love was tested by the prince of generosity, and because of fear then he was terrified, but here restored to calm. There he denies whom he loved, here he showed his love for him whom he had denied. Please go to side B. This very love was weak and narrow, till it was enlarged and made strong by the Holy Spirit. And after the fullness of grace was poured into his soul, which before was so lukewarm, the Spirit within burned to bear witness to Christ, and unsealed the trembling lips that had withheld the truth, so that while all on whom the Spirit had descended spoke in various tongues, and while the multitude of the Jews stood round about them, he shone out above all the rest in bearing witness to Christ, and confounded those who had slain him by his witness to the resurrection. Should anyone desire to contemplate this so meaningful divine wonder, let him read the Acts of the Apostles. There let him with wonder see Peter proclaiming him for denying whom he had grieved. There he will see that tongue changed from cowardliness to confidence, from servitude to freedom, converting to the praise of Christ the tongues of so many, that were enemies, of whom one had led him to denial, being unable to stand fast before it. In short, such splendor of grace shone forth in him, such fullness of the Holy Spirit, such weight of most precious truth came forth from his mouth as he preached to them, that he made Jews who were enemies and slayers of Christ, and who formed part of that vast multitude, 
ready to die for him, those by whom he had stood in fear of being put to death with him. This the Holy Spirit accomplished, promised beforehand, and then sent down upon them. It was these great and wondrous blessings the Lord contemplated when he said, They have both seen and hated both me and my Father, that the word may be fulfilled which is written in their law, that they have hated me without cause. But when the paraclete cometh, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceedeth from the Father, he shall give testimony of me, and you shall give testimony of me. For he, by giving testimony, and by making most courageous witnesses of them, took away fear from Christ's friends, and changed the hate of his enemies to love. Turning then to the Lord our God, the Father Almighty, let us, as best we can, give thanks with all our hearts, beseeching him that in his goodness he will mercifully hear our prayers, by his divine grace drive evil from our thoughts and actions, increase our faith, grant us his holy inspirations, and lead us to joy without end. Through his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. St. Leo the Great, Pope and Doctor, on the Lord's Ascension. The mystery of our salvation, beloved, that which the Creator of all things deigned to accomplish at the price of his own blood, was from the day of his corporal birth till the last moment of his passion, steadfastly accomplished along a divinely decreed path of humiliation. And though while in the form of a servant there shone forth many signs of his divinity, yet everything he did throughout his time tended to confirm the truth of the humanity he had put on. But after his passion, and when he had destroyed the bonds of death, which had lost its power in countering him in whom there was no sin, infirmity changed to might, mortality to immortality, humiliation to glory. This the Lord Jesus made clear to the eyes of many, by frequent and clear proofs, until he ended in heaven itself the triumph of the victory he had won over death. And as at Easter time the resurrection of the Lord was then the cause of our joyful celebration, so his ascension into heaven is the reason of this day's rejoicing, recalling to mind and fittingly honoring that day on which our poor lowly nature was in the person of Christ, raised above all the hosts of heaven, above the ranks of all the angels, above the sublimity of all the powers, to the throne of God the Father. In this order of divine events we are rooted and founded, so that when that was withdrawn from men's sight, which was rightly felt of itself to claim our reverence, God's grace became yet more wonderful, and faith did not fail, and hope did not falter, and love did not grow cold. For this is the power of worthy souls, this is the glory of those who truly believe that they believe without faltering what is unseen by the eyes of the body, and there fasten their desires where sight cannot follow. Where could this devotion arise in our hearts, or how should any man be justified by faith if our salvation was rooted and founded in things we see with our eyes. It was because of this the Lord said to the man who seemed to doubt the resurrection of Christ, until by sight and touch he had examined the proofs of the passion in his flesh. Because thou hast seen me, he says, thou hast believed. But blessed are they that have not seen, and have believed that we may therefore, dearly beloved, be made ready for this blessedness, our Lord Jesus Christ, after he had disposed in order all that related to the preaching of the gospel and to the mysteries of the New Testament, was in the presence of his disciples, and on the fortieth day after his resurrection, raised up to heaven. He withdrew for a time his bodily presence, for he is to abide at the right hand of the Father, until the times which have been divinely decreed for the multiplication of the children of the church are accomplished. And then, in the same body in which he ascended, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And so what was visible in Christ is now veiled in mystery, and that faith might be more perfect and more steadfast. Vision was succeeded by revealed truth, whose authority the hearts of the faithful 
illumined by light from above, would now begin to follow. This, then, is the faith which, enlarged by the Lord's ascension and made firm by the gifts of the Holy Ghost, neither bonds nor prison, neither exile nor hunger nor fire, neither the fangs of wild beasts nor the tortures devised by the cruelty of persecutors, have overcome. For this faith men everywhere throughout the world have fought steadfastly, even to the shedding of their blood, not alone men, but women also, and beardless boys, and even tender maidens. This faith has cast out demons, banished sickness, raised the dead. And even the blessed apostles, who had been encouraged by so many miracles, and taught by so many discourses, were yet terrified at the cruelty of the Lord's passion, and had only with so much hesitation accepted the reality of His resurrection, were so greatly uplifted, by the Lord's ascension, that whatever before had made them fear now turned their hearts toward joy. For they had turned the whole gaze of their soul upwards to the divinity of him who sits at the Father's right hand, and they were no longer held by the fact of his bodily presence from directing their mind's eye towards that being who, descending on earth, did not leave the Father, and descending to heaven, had not left his disciples. It was then, dearly beloved, the Son of Man, the Son of God, became known in a more perfect, a holier manner, when he betook himself to the majestic glory of the Father, and in an ineffable way began to be more present to us in his divinity, as his humanity became more remote to us. Then a more instructed faith began by way of the soul to draw nigh to that Son who was equal with the Father, without need to touch and feel the bodily substance in Christ, in which he is less than the Father. For though the nature of his glorified body remains, the faith of the believing began to be called, whither the only begotten who is equal to the Father might be touched and felt, not by our bodily hand, but by the spiritual understanding. It was because of this the Lord said to Mary Magdalene, when she, representing the church, drew near to touch him, Do not touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. That is, I do not wish you to approach me in a bodily manner, nor that you should know me by the feel of my flesh. I would have you wait for what is higher. I am preparing for thee what is greater. When I have ascended to my Father, then you shall touch me more perfectly and more truly for you shall know what you touch not, and believe what you do not see. And as the disciples looked upwards, and with rapt gaze followed the Lord as he ascended into heaven, two angels in shining white garments stood by them, and said to them, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you looking up to heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come, as you have seen him going into heaven. By these words all the children of the church were taught that they are to believe that Jesus will be seen coming again in that same body in which he ascended, and that likewise we cannot doubt that he to whom from his birth angels had ministered, to him all things are subject. For as an angel announced to the Blessed Virgin that Christ would be conceived of the Holy Ghost, so also was it the voice of the heavenly choir that proclaimed him to the shepherds, newborn of the virgin. And as the first testimonies of that told men he had risen from the dead were those of angels from on high, so likewise was it foretold by the ministry of angels that he would come again in the flesh to judge the world, so that we may know what great powers shall stand about him when he shall come to judge to whom so many ministered when he was himself being judged. Let us then exalt, beloved, with joy of soul and rejoicing, with fitting praise in God's presence, lift up the now free eyes of the soul to that place where Christ abides. Let not earthly things hold here the souls that are called above. Let not perishable things fill the hearts that are chosen for eternal things. Let no false allurements hold back those who walk the way of truth. And so should believing souls pass amid these temporal things as knowing they but journey through this world's valley, in which, though certain things beguile us, we must not feebly yield, but press manfully on our way. 
To this the most blessed apostle Peter exhorts us, and by that love for feeding the sheep of Christ, which he received by his own threefold confession of love for the Lord, he cries, beseeching us, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to refrain yourselves from carnal desires which war against the soul, and for whom, unless the devil do carnal desires, make war, who, when souls are striving towards higher things, delights to bind them fast to the pleasures of perishable things, and lead them away from those seats from which he himself has fallen. Against such wiles each believing soul must judiciously stand guard, that he may defeat the enemy in whatever he tries. And there is nothing more efficacious against the wiles of the devil, dearly beloved, than the kindness of forgiveness and bountifulness in charity, by means of which sin is either avoided or overcome. But this high degree of virtue is not reached until that which is its enemy is rooted out. For what is more inimical to mercy and to the works of charity than greed, from whose root arise the fruits of all evil? And unless this be cut at the source, it must follow that the thorns and thistles of wickedness will spring up in the field of that heart where this plant of evil flourishes rather than any plant of true virtue. Let us then, most dearly beloved, stand firm against this so destructive evil and follow after charity, without which no virtue can flourish, so that we may ascend by that way of love to Christ by which he has come down to us, to whom, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, be honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. St. Cesarius, Bishop of Arles, on eating and drinking the Word of God. What it means to hunger after justice, the right of the people to ask the priest for the Word of God. Among the Beatitudes, which our Lord and Savior deigned to number in the Gospel, he also included this, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. Happy are they to whom the Lord has deigned to give this exalted hunger, this most desirable thirst. But, brethren, how does a man hunger after justice? You hunger after justice when you desire gladly and with patience to hear the word of God. For of this food was it said, They that eat me shall yet hunger, and they that drink me shall yet thirst. For though it is more perfect to do than to know, Yet we must first know what is just before we can do it. He must learn God's will who desires to fulfill it, and therefore he who desires to learn of justice hungers after the knowledge of justice. We must therefore learn of justice so that afterwards we may merit to fulfill it. If therefore, as we believe, you truly hunger and thirst after justice, in order that this blessedness may, through the grace of God, be fulfilled in you, whenever the word of God is for long withheld from you, let you not wait until such time as we shall preach it to you, but let you eagerly and confidently demand it of us as something that is rightly due to you. The Obligation of Priests to Communicate the Word of God If we on the one hand desire always to offer it to you, while you do not desire to seek it from us, should we at times be neglectful, we may then perhaps be judged importunate by those who do not know our danger. For they who do know the grave burden laid on priests will understand that even though we preach often, we yet communicate to you less than we are bound to. For the Holy Spirit has testified to priests by the mouth of the prophet, Cry, cease not. He does not say, Cry out for many days, but cry, cease not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show thy people their wicked doings. And again, if thou declare not to the wicked his wicked way, I will require his blood at thy hand. And the apostle, therefore watch, keeping in memory that for three years I ceased not, with tears to admonish every one of you night and day. If the apostle, that he might be without blame before God, preach night and day the word of God, what will happen to us, who rarely or only after the lapse of many days provide spiritual pasture 
for the flock entrusted to us. Because of this the same apostle adjures Timothy, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. And as though he were asked why he begins with such a fearful exhortation, he goes on to say, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, entreat, rebuke. What does in season and out of season mean, if not at suitable times to those who desire it, and with urgency to those who are unwilling? The word of God must be offered to those who desire it. It must be urged on those who are averse to it lest standing before the tribunal of Christ they may declare against us that we did not warn them, and he shall then require their blood at our hands. And so with great fear and trembling we must take thought so that that terrible sentence shall not be pronounced against us, which the servant merited to hear, who had neglected to double the talent he had received. Wicked and slothful servant, he says, Why hast thou not committed my money to the bankers? and at my coming I should have received my own with usury. And then what follows? May God deliver us from it. And the unprofitable servant, he says, cast ye out into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why, he says, hast thou not committed my money to the bankers? By money, dearly beloved, understand only that which is to be preached in the church. The bankers who should receive the money are none other than the Christian people. For as it shall be for us a grievous sin not to have committed the money of the Lord to the bank of your heart, so likewise no small danger threatens you who are unwilling by means of good works to double what you have received by the words we have preached to you. This is the food of the soul. Since therefore you are aware both of ours and of your own danger, as often as it shall happen that the word of God is ministered to you tardily, treat this as though you would if the substance of your daily food were withheld from your body. For with us the hunger of the soul ought not to be less than that of the body. For the more worthy we know the soul to be, the greater must be our care that it receive the food it needs. For if our body be fed twice each day, why should anyone think it troublesome and uncalled for, if the soul that belongs to God is fed but once in seven days. For as the body is restored by this earthly food, so is the soul refreshed by the word of God. And so as often as it is tardily offered to you, awaken us from our sloth and demand what is rightfully yours. The priests are as kinney, providing the milk of the word of God, the people as calves, eagerly seeking it. For in the church the priests are like the milking kinney, the Christian people resemble the calves. For as the cows wander through the fields and the meadows, and go through vineyards and the olive groves, and from the leaves and grass they graze on provide milk for the calves, so priests, assiduously reading the word of God on the wide hills of the scriptures, should, from the herbage they gather, provide spiritual milk for their children, so that they may be as Paul, who said, I gave you milk to drink, not meat. Not, not unfittingly, then, beloved brethren, do priests seem to be like the kinney. For also as the cow has two udders from which she nourishes her calves, so must priests from the two udders of the Old and the New Testament provide spiritual food for their people. Yet consider, dearest brethren, how not alone do kinney seek out their young calves, but these also come running to them, and often so buffet them on the udders with their eager heads, that at times, if the calves are big, they seem to uplift their mothers from the ground. But this the mothers contentedly suffer, for they desire to see their calves grow strong. And this good priests should also seek after and desire, that their spiritual children should press them with questions regarding their own salvation, so that while divine grace is given to the children, who as it were buffet them with questions, a divine reward is being prepared for the priests who thus make known to them the truths of sacred scriptures. I tell you this then, so that this resemblance may be found both in you and in us. For we are eager to suffer from you this longed-for hunger of the soul, so long as we see that your souls grow strong in the love of Christ. 
And as we must gather the flowers of Scripture to make food for souls, so also should you seek it, and with great eagerness. For as calves beat strongly against the maternal udders, that they may the more freely draw forth the needed food, so should the Christian people seek eagerly from their priests, as from the udders of the church, to acquire the food of salvation, and the nourishment the soul needs, so that should priests be slow in giving it, and the people too worldly to inquire for it, that may not come to pass which was written, I will send a famine into the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. We trust in the mercy of God that we shall be given a zeal for reading and preaching, and that you will be given an eager desire to hear us, that we may be able to give a good account before the tribunal of Christ, because of the sermons we have preached, and that you may receive the reward of salvation because of your obedient hearing of the word of God and of your perseverance in good works. By the help of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. St. Cesarius, Bishop of Arles, on how the word of God is to be received. Paternal Solicitude for the Weak in Body Some days ago, because of those who suffer with their feet or labor under some bodily weakness, I advised you with fatherly earnestness, and in a manner I besought you, that when the acts of the martyrs are read at length, or at all events during certain longer lessons, that those who were unable to stand should, sitting down, listen with attentive ears, and with humility and in silence, to what was being read. Now there are some among our children who think that all, or at least many who are well in health, may regularly do this. For as soon as the word of God begins to be read, they decide to stretch themselves out as if they were in their beds, and would that they do only that, and keeping silence receive the word of God with a devout heart, and not begin to distract themselves with idle gossiping, so that they neither hear what is read, nor let others hear it. Now, venerable brethren, I ask you, and with a father's concern I want to impress upon you, that while the lessons are being read, or while the word of God is being preached, no one is to stretch himself out upon the ground, unless where great weakness compels him to do so. And in that case let him not lie down, but rather sit down. And in this way let him, with a loving heart, take in whatever is being made known to him. The word of God is in no way less than the body of Christ, nor should it be received less worthily. I ask you, brothers or sisters, tell me, which to you seems the greater, the word of God or the body of Christ? If you wish to say what is true to you, will have to answer that the word of God is not less than the body of Christ. Therefore, just as when the body of Christ is administered to us, what care do we not use so that nothing of it falls from our hands to the ground? So should we with equal care see that the word of God, which is being imparted to us, shall not be lost to our soul while we speak or think of something else? For he who listens carelessly to the word of God is not less guilty than he who through his own inattention suffers the body of Christ to fall to the ground. The preacher is a giver of precious jewels. Now I would like to know whether if at the time when the preacher begins to preach to you the word of God, we decided to bestow on you the most precious jewels and earrings and finger rings, would our daughters choose to stay where they are or to come forward to receive them? Without any doubt and with great good will they would accept what was offered them. But since we neither can nor ought to offer bodily adornments, we are not therefore readily listened to. But it is not just that we who minister to you in spiritual things should not be properly regarded. Let her who gratefully hears the word of God be certain that she has received earrings for her soul, brought down from the heavenly home. And she, who being taught to help those in need, holds out her hand to give alms, receives a bracelet, placed there by Christ. For as a body given to evil puts on earthly adornments, that for a while it may gratify carnal eyes, to its own loss and that of those who sinfully desire it, so the soul that is spiritually adorned by means of divine instruction, 
with the everlasting spiritual pearls of good works, shall be prepared to share the company of the heavenly spouse, and enter with him to the wedding feast. So she shall not hear what is written in the Gospels, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having on a wedding garment? And that she to whom this was said may not adorned and not clothed as are the just, merit to hear, bind his hands and feet and cast him into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather may she because of her garment of virtue and good works hear these words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The preacher is as a mother who wishes to adorn her daughter. What reward does he ask of his labor? I ask you, daughters, to listen with attention to what we have to say. Should a mother wish to adorn her child, and should she, refusing the adornments, throw herself on the ground and turn this way and that, and will not be quiet so that her mother may adorn her as best she can, may not such a daughter be rightly chastised and scolded? Consider me, then, as the mother of your souls, who wishes to array you that you may appear without spot or blemish before the tribunal of the eternal judge, and anxious to provide remedies as well as ornaments for your souls, I desire to join together what was sundered, to mend what was torn, to heal what was wounded, to clean what was soiled, to renew what was destroyed, and to adorn what is healthy with spiritual pearls. I spare not my labor. Why should anyone think to accept it with indifference? For since the adornments of the body are bought only at great cost, unless you find someone willing to give them to you, with what thanks